Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dark Rhino Security, Security Confidential. Today, we have a superstar guest with us. We're really honored to have him. He doesn't need much of an introduction. He is Kareem Hijazi. Kareem is the founder and CEO of Prevalon. He is the host of the podcast, The Introverted Iconoclast, which we'll talk to him a lot more about. Uh, he has been in InfoSec since the 90s, so ton of experience, former director of intelligence for Mandiant. He's been on umpteen news outlets. You've probably seen him a thousand times. He's a serial entrepreneur. In fact, his second company, Unveilance, uh, they were so effective that they uh, disrupted the malicious operations of the hacker collective Anonymous, who were not too happy about that. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show, Kareem. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You know, um, we, we get several entrepreneurs on here and, and they're, they're all characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I, I don't, I, and I don't mean that, I mean, I'm one myself, so yeah. I, I know uh, that, uh, that profile well, but there's always such an interesting story. And, and I look at your background and you have done everything from government work to consulting to working at some of the most prestigious cybersecurity companies in the world and and then built your own ecosystem and what's your driver how, how did you get into being an entrepreneur i really want to know that, that you know. yeah really good question and you know funny i don't get that question as often as you think um not as direct really right? i get i get a lot yeah it's interesting i get a lot of folks that ask very specific targeted well, why did you do this specific thing or what drove you to do that but not the broad and in fact, that's kind of a good good question because it segues into why I started the podcast and some other things that we'll talk about. But yeah. I think there are probably two or three things that are really key to my motivation and drive with this. And, and one of them was I watched my father, who was a businessman, uh, do some pretty interesting stuff. Now, what's fascinating is it wasn't positive. I was upset with my okay. father. <laughs> oh, I was upset that he was busy all the time and he was working on things. And, you know, it was the classic father son scenario where it's like, can't you come play ball or fish with me? Well, you know, no, no, no. I got to go work that, you know, dad, like, sorry, son can't do it. So funny enough for a very, very long time, it was, you know, work and pursuit of money and all that was not a positive thing in my life growing up. It was a, it was the reason for not having the time I would have liked as I think many, many people have in the background sometimes. What's ironic is that many years later, when I finally um, started to come around in my early 20s to saying, you know, I probably need to make some money. This is kind of silly. Uh, yeah. You know, I need to go and, and figure <laughs> out something. Um, I did go and and re-engage with my father and worked with him briefly. In fact, that's one of my first pivots into competitive intelligence, otherwise known as corporate spying, was with a, a company that he was working with. And so funny enough, wow. full circle to that. And there I was kind of happenstance into that role of, of what turned into my consultancy, all sp sort of spawned from going and being curious about what my father did. And then even a stranger turn of events, my father never wanted me to be entrepreneurial. He's like, look, I've worked my butt off to get wow. to a certain level in life so that you don't have to do this sort of slog. And I'm like, but it's in my genes for God's sake. I want to do this kind of thing. So very interesting, very long sort of involved thing. And a lot of it was probably some sort of validation need with, with sort of seeing, having him see me as a viable person in terms of similar to him, you know, that could go and build something myself. And then once that faded, it became, very addictive, as you well know. It's something yes. that when you get it right, and something, and you capture lightning in a bottle, maybe once, maybe mm -hmm. twice. It's it's incredible. There's nothing yeah. nothing like it. Um, it so, is, and you're, I think you're ruined. Yeah. You can't go work for oh, somebody. God, no. Completely it, it's ruined. It's over. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But you know that is that is such a fascinating story, uh, and and I think it is. In my own experience, it's mm -hmm. it, it has a lot of similarities to mine. It has a lot of similarities to a lot of other entrepreneurs. In fact, while you were speaking, that I don't know if you remember the song "The Cats in the Cradle." Oh man, but, uh, legendary, <laughs> legendary, yeah. right? It, it 
totally comes full circle, right? I mean, in the end, the the child grows up to be like their parent. And, and, you know, I think maybe a little, I'm getting a little off topic on this, but Mm -hmm. maybe we've lost a little bit of that in this world today. You know, I would agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a good thing. You know, it's, um, Children, you know, if their if their number one role models become their parents, mm-hmm. in a lot of instances, I think that might lead to more good than the bad. Oh, and we couldn't lost agree more. A bit of that. Yeah, no, I agree, and and that's why the answer is a little different than what you hear in the generic answers of oh well, I knew I wanted to make a ton of money and I wanted to be you know rich and I had these ideas. Well, that's all there, but that's not the driver. The driver is an emotional driver. The driver is something that gives you some sort of feeling, and um, you know, and like you, like we talked about, you know, it's you don't have that feeling until something works, and then when something works, it's even that much more catapulting into the next phase of things. So, per per your statement about cats in the cradle, my kids are doing what I did to my dad, which is, well, can't you can't you do this? I'm like, no, nope, sorry, I'm busy, and I was doing that for many many years, and now I'm finally changing that methodology around actually to be honest so i'm shifting from being so explicitly focused on work to focused on personal well-being and things like that which is a big thing that gets forgotten about a ton with entrepreneurs as well so that's a whole other that could be a whole show in its own right by the way it absolutely can and we'd love to discuss that we've had um some very interesting topics in that regard. And it's a big part of entrepreneurship. I mean, when you Mm -hmm. look at it, um, there's one thing to have the knowledge in the area in which you're pursuing. But I think even bigger than that is um, dealing with those fears of failure, jumping into the Mm -hmm. unknown, you're betting on yourself. In fact, since we're there, I got to ask you, do you have any advice on that for anyone that's thinking about taking a huge step in that direction? Well, you know, it's, it's one of those classic situations where if, um, you have it in you and, and, uh, you know, you're willing to take the risk. Cause that's the, the part that a lot of folks don't get past. They think themselves out of the opportunity. Um, yes. I have a friend of mine in particular, I talk about him a fair bit on this, on these podcasts that I do either as a guest or as a host. And it's a, it's funny. It's, it's, it's ironically funny because he'll call me with an idea that's good, at least in first glance, it's, it sounds like a good idea. And I'm like, that's great. Go for it. He's like, yeah, but you know, then I'll, but what, what if that happens? And then if that happens, that'll happen. And then if that happens then I really can't do that. And then literally 30 minutes into the conversation, yeah. he's convinced himself out of doing it. And it's sad because he's done this several times. <laughs> and if he had just pursued it one of those times, who knows, you know, he may have actually kind of gotten the momentum and the inertia to keep it going. I look as a, as very personal advice, and this is not any kind of financial advice from me, but I say take the leap because this is experiential at, at minimum. You you have an incredibly interesting experience trying to start companies and driving things forward. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Most most things don't work in the beginning, as we right. all know. It takes several attempts to get somewhere. So, you you know, I couldn't agree more. People that are listening that are on the precipice of starting, I say jump because it's terrifying, but that's where you feel alive, frankly, when things do start to work. Or the worst that happens is you go back to what you were doing. That's right. I mean, if you that's look it. at it in that regard, uh, I was going to say, is failure such a bad thing? In fact, no, can you even not. succeed without it? I've said that many a times. I'm sure the right. listeners are tired of it, but can you? Yeah, very true, is though. Is it really possible? Is it possible? So tell us about the introverted iconoclast. At first, that's an interesting name. Yeah, it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, how did it come about? And what's your mission there? I, I mean, yeah. You, you, yeah. What are you doing with this thing? What, what are you trying to do? So the name is indeed a mouthful. Um, but when you peel apart the, the words, um, and funny enough, as much as it wouldn't seem like I am, I am, a, I am an introverted person. Um, I kind of... Really? play an extroverted person on TV, literally like what we're doing now. Um, yeah, I just, I, I'm, and I think people have a misperception sometimes of introverted people as shy and completely sitting in the corner of wallflowers. Yes. Uh, you know, there are probably extreme versions of that that may be considered that, but no, I think my version of introversion is two things. It's, it's being more reserved and more ingesting versus, you know, 
egressing information in many cases. Um, wouldn't you wouldn't believe so from my podcast, but that is actually a huge part of an intelligence operation is listening more than you're speaking in many cases. So that actually came in handy as a character trait with my work. And I also don't particularly like ruffling feathers, which is really a problem because if you're going to get anywhere in the world, you're going to eventually irritate somebody or something uh, in order to be a change maker, which is the definition of an iconoclast, at least the modern version of the term, right? I'm not. And you've definitely yeah. ruffled feathers. I have. I... <laughs> so all my attempts to not do it have failed miserably, and I've uh, become more of a extroverted uh, disruptor than an introverted iconoclast. But my intention was to always be someone that was a change maker, but uh, did it in a very diplomatic and non wave making way, which is very hard and almost impossible. So I like the contradiction in terms. It really defined my character and my intention from the beginning of when I started everything I wanted to do. Um, and that's how it came about. So it's a very long winded story for the, the titling of it. No, and, no, but um, it's really cool yeah. that because we would never guess that about you. I, yeah. I can tell you, having <laughs> seen you on the news so many times, having seen right. you uh, in so many places, I'm like, there's no way <laughs> Kareem mm -hmm. would, I would never have begged you for an introvert, <laughs> you know? Right. But uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that it's it's very interesting. So is is the show what are you focusing on the nuts and bolts of cyber or is it? No, 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 and it, I'm not actually, which is interesting. So the origins of the podcast, um, believe it or not, are not as they don't start glamorous, but they end up a little bit more so. Um, OK, originally, I, I was like anyone else started to see that podcasting was starting to manifest as a really powerful medium for delivering information or I don't know, marketing comp a company, a product, a person, whatever the case sure. may be. So sure. literally I said, all right, I called my marketing team. I talked to my CTO at the time. I'm like, start a podcast for the company. Just go figure it out. I don't know. I don't know. I don't okay. listen to podcasts quite <laughs> frankly. So this is kind of funny. So I was like, go do it. And they didn't do it <laughs> back to startup <laughs> life where, where, you know, usually you do everything at some point and, and, and sure. or, or have to do something at some point have um, to. because you're, yeah. no one else is going to do it. So they didn't do it. They didn't do it. I asked them again, they didn't do it. And I was like, okay, fine. This can't be that difficult. So I got, did a typical podcast thing. I got all the equipment in the world that you don't need for a podcast. And I had, but it was fun buying mic. it. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> I looked set up. I had the switches and dials and mixing boards. And I was like, what the hell am I going to? Anyway, all that set up. You should see Emily's the... room. <laughs> there you go. She's... I was playing Emily, which I should not be doing. I'm not a producer. Right? And uh, you don't need that for a one person kind of situation. And, you know, I didn't have the Joe Rogan experience in front of me <laughs> with a bunch of guests sitting at the table. <laughs> But what was interesting was I did the classic thing, even as a seasoned entrepreneur, I got all set up and then I stared at the empty mic and I didn't have anything to say. And then I started to figure out like, okay, well, let me start talking about some things. And I did a couple recordings that were nuts and bolts recordings. They were very, okay. they weren't technical, but they were boring. <laughs> they were just <laughs> nothing you wouldn't hear elsewhere and nothing you wouldn't hear in my interviews with with media, which I have to be pretty structured and scripted in some cases with right. those. So I was like, why would I want to put something out like this that um, you could probably just catch me on Google or YouTube doing, right? Not even mine. Right. And that's when it occurred to me that I always wanted to do some sort of a memoir uh, of what's hap happened, what we'll talk about through this episode, right? And I thought, this yes. is a good medium. Let me try that out. And so literally the first, I think, four or five episodes of this podcast was a basically recollection and storytelling of my career of how I got to where I was in in sort of short form so little vignettes of what happened literally everything from jumping from a bartending job to a literally being a corporate spy inadvertently not even intending to get into that world then turning into a counterintelligence pro and then moving into cybersecurity and so I did it over the course of I think four or five episodes and I was hooked on my own podcast so I got excited oh, that's very cool and that's how it that's how it all came into being um, but to answer your question a little bit more deeply about where it's going and what its purpose is, I think it's still coming into focus um, because I did indeed okay. move into interviewing folks similar to what you're doing. Um, and I get some really interesting people. They're not necessarily cybersecurity people. I think I've had quite candidly maybe two people in the entire span of this podcast. One is our snake, if you know who he is from 
White yes. Hat Security, and then now yes. he's over at Tenable. Really, really amazing guy. If you ever get a chance to talk to him, and then and then Rob Lee, a right? good friend from Dragos. Yep. So I, I yeah. listened to that podcast. Yeah, it was good. That was, was an inter- That was an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, we we've had. I'll tell you, we, we've had laughter yoga coaches on, we had brand <laughs> awesome. manager from uh, Procter and Gamble on. We've had New York Times bestselling authors. Yeah. Because while they may not directly be in cybersecurity, there are concepts that they're putting forth that mm-hmm. are absolutely relevant. When you look at counterintelligence and you look at understanding your adversary, getting into their mind and creating defense in depth, creating those are big, broad brush conversations. They're not Agreed. pure nuts and bolts. And I think there are a lot about mindset in many ways. And and if the mindset doesn't exist, the execution is going to be pretty mediocre. And we see a lot of that out there in the industry. Yes, very much so. So, yeah, please do that. I, I think uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to tune in. I, I'm going to subscribe to yours, see what, uh, sure. what's going on. Sounds, and, and, you know, quite frankly, the other thing is that we, there's so many cybersecurity podcasts out there. Right. And it is a, in many ways, it's such a dry topic. It's the one thing I, I've been um, brainstorming with Emily and with some of our other marketing team members is we got to get this to a place where people are going to want to tune in. And I think that for the 50, 60 year olds, unless they're truly interested in this and are, and are right. going to get do they're not, we've lost them, but I'd like to get the younger people yeah. to listen in and develop that mindset. And if they develop that mindset, it's going to naturally lead to a safer world. Maybe not a perfect world, but a safer sure. world. Oh, great. You know. Yeah, no, true. And and I think to your point very quickly um, on, on, an, on a podcast and cybersecurity podcast, there's a, there's a dichotomy because cybersecurity is probably the most sexy, glamorous rock star part of IT. It is. Collectively, yes. right? And it's just, it's the more interesting stuff. However, <clears throat> you still have to get to a subset of it that is a little bit of, I'll be very candid where I think I live, you know, because I don't have a boring day in my, in my world, um, <laughs> as we'll talk about. Those are the ones, those are the stories that are more what people kind of think it's like from either Hollywood as it's, as it's conveyed it, you know, to the, yeah. to the masses. And certainly in more recent times where headline news has made it a, a just a common yeah. known issue. So finally it's, it's coming to that point where people are starting to go, yeah, that's scary. You know, and, and the fear factor of it is there's an excitement right. with that as well. So it's terrifying, but also exciting, but there's not that many of us in that world, right? There's, and then, then you even further dissect it away between government and private sector and you even mm. further reduce down and whittle down to maybe just a few folks that really have an interesting life on a day-to-day basis. So you're right. It's, it's unfortunately not as common to be able to have folks that have these types of stories. Um, and then certainly have them manifest in the form of a podcast is again, another, um, reductive effort. So you're right. I don't know that we're going to yeah. have a whole slew of them, but, um, I think there'll be some for everyone's kind of flavor profiles, depending on what they like. That- very cool. So let, let's tell us a story. You you were mm-hmm. you got mentioned in the book. We are anonymous. So what led to that? What what's the backstory on this? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Parmi Olson. I love you dearly for writing that book. Um, so in two thousand, um, this goes back a ways. So two thousand eight nine. Uh, I was involved in some work that had to do with pursuing some botnets back then. Um, and for those that don't know botnets, cause I know you have folks that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily cybersecurity folks. Botnets are, are a computer network that have, that has been ad hoc together by adversaries. They've deployed things like malware onto machines through a variety of methods. And those machines become zombies and they all speak to a command, a command and control environment that the adversary controls. And they essentially build an army of zombified machines out there to do their bidding. Back then, uh, really, it was less about information gathering. It was more about denial of service attacks, which is essentially having all these machines call onto some central point, some server somewhere to shut it sure. down. And they're so still our prevalent focus, today. Yeah, still is, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So it hasn't yeah, gone yeah. anywhere. It's just they've added to the toolkits that they now uh, you know, able sure. to use these botnets for. 
And um, that led to my the founding of my company called Unvalence, which, um, as you may have mentioned in the in the preface of this of the show, resulted in in uh, getting acquired by Mandiant, which a whole other story there. But leading up to that event, um, I got Unvalence starting going in a, in a really good way. I had a lot of inertia, and I was really kind of spearheaded a, an offensive effort. And I'm very careful with the way I frame those words because the minute I say offensive within the community, they all freak out. And it's true because it is a very, very delicate topic because offensive implies that you're hacking back, you know, in an, in an environment where it's either nation state or it's cyber criminal. And sometimes you don't know what the target is that you're, you're responding against. It could be an innocent Kareem, is it party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is is it really hacking back, or is it getting to be proactive? Because in yeah. when you look at even uh, Sands Institute put out the uh, scale, of the investment scale of cybersecurity. The last mm-hmm. block on that is proactive. You know, yeah. d- aggression. It, it, so it, it's both. It's it, again, this, this is the problem with our industry with lexicon. People get wrapped around the axle on words, right? So you're entirely correct. My version of what I consider what I do is proactive, and it's yes, it's it's impacting infrastructure of the adversaries, but it's done in a very very specialized way, which okay. leads me to the story. So yes. we were taking down infrastructure, namely command and control environments of bad guys, indiscriminately in 2011 when the company was in they full motion for happy about that. <laughs> no, they were not. And well, no one was ever, you know, the bad guys, the whole gaggle of them that we were impacting, whether they were nation state actors or they were cyber criminals, were not happy with us. Well, it just so happened that we took down part of the infrastructure that Lulsec had set up, set up to attack some okay. of these environments. And so in doing so, all of a sudden their systems went offline and they're like, wait, what? And they went digging around to see what happened and realized that it was us that did it. We didn't even know that we took their stuff down. We were just indiscriminately going after what we do on a daily basis. And we drew their fire, essentially, and ended up in this online fight between my team and them. Because, again, we were small enough to where we didn't have a PR team that said don't reply because right. the big guys never did. They just sort of dealt with it, moved on because it's kind of like, don't give it any energy. Yep. But we were also tenacious enough to say, no, don't mess with us either. I mean, you know, just because you guys think you're black hats, it doesn't mean we're not, we're not as formidable as you are. And so it ended <laughs> up this pissing contest between me verbally, essentially over these encrypted chat channels that were recorded that Parmi got a hold of for the book. And wow. Um, I worked in in uh, symphony with law enforcement and the intelligence community to ultimately uh, identify the folks. And yeah, they they went down for coming after us. So they they picked on the wrong group. Say say safely that's that, that uh, well. yeah. wrong victim selection in their on right. Their part. That is <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That that is that's it's rare that we get that side of the coin in mm-hmm. in our world in infosec. That someone actually did something to make uh, the bad guy's life miserable. Because you always hear about it. It seems like, you know, yeah. you, look, you turn on the TV. Someone's got hit with ransomware. Someone's got data stolen. It's a constant, ongoing thing. Yeah. And you rarely do you hear, well, we went and nabbed like 30 people that were mm-hmm. doing this. And and we made their life hell. Or we yes. turned them against themselves. You know, you just yes. don't get that. No, you don't. And it wasn't without damage and, you know, kind of shrapnel in our direction. We had a lot, I mean, I was my, you know, a lot of worries about what was going to happen because they were just like most of these cyber criminals and some of these actors that are, you know, geared to be influencers. They're Twitter jockeys. I mean, they're gloating yeah. of what they've done. And, you know, and part of the challenge that I had was, no, you don't get away with just going out there and blasting a bunch of garbage on, on the Internet and through social media to get some more clout. So that's why I spoke up, which was really rare um, and and questionable because it would have it could have re- resulted in a really bad ending, too. So we got very lucky. Yeah. Um, thankfully, no one looked at us as a company that had been you know attacked, which could have made us a pariah and toxic. So there was a lot of good maneuvering by my PR team that I did hire at the time to help me navigate those waters. And so 
very challenging period, admittedly. I don't want to make it sound like it was easy. We, we went through a lot. No, I, I believe it. Um, yeah. that, that's taking it on the chin and, and mm-hmm. really, you know, you're putting yourself out there when you're, right. when you're doing that. But that's, uh, I'm so glad that there's people like you out there that, that oh, do, do thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, and there's a <laughs> lot of folks that, you know, in the similar period, if you remember, this is ancient history now, but H.B. Gary going through a lot of trouble back yep. earlier that year. Same group. Um, didn't quite have the same outcome that we had with this group, but uh, it was just happenstance and circumstances that led led the way it did. But yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because some very credible folks really got damaged in that process in that in that period. Um, we just happen so, to be one of the lucky ones. So you've been in the counterintelligence game, which is a lot like the, the, the it, it's a cat mouse thing. And right. how tell us. Take us into the minds of these bad actors. Are these just criminals or are mm-hmm. they getting uh, state backing? Are they just after money or is their intentions more, um, you know, nationally oriented where they they think they're doing something for a much larger cause? W- what's going on here, like in by mm-hmm. and large? Yeah. So your question kind of covered the gamut of yes. <laughs> um, yes to all of that. Yes, but in different in different silos. So so we can we can broadly divest groups into two, broadly speaking. Okay. One is a nation state actor that is a government funded uh, or motivated group that um, has a very specific task in mind, usually is well funded um, and will do and we'll get into a little bit of the, the, the nuances there as well. And then there's the other side that's purely financially motivated. These are indeed cyber criminals that are gangs that have now become quite successful. And this that's where ransomware lives, right? Because that's yeah. a big, big part of the equation today that everyone knows about. Um, so it's broadly speaking, those two. Now, I, I, I'm going to really throw a nice wrench in the system here. There's a <laughs> lot of ties that bind those two groups together. It's a lot of cross-pollination between private sector okay. and government groups. A lot of moonlighting going on. Government actors that are well-trained that do their day job for ex government, but then go and do cyber crime in their, in their evening side hustle. So, and maybe are endorsed to do it by the government they're working for. So it's incredibly intertwined as far as the mind of the bad guys. This is really interesting. It's a great question. Um, some are purely just taking orders. They just, okay. it's their job. They're former intelligence operatives that are now purely in, in, in front of a computer somewhere in some of the more nefarious nation state groups that we know about that are just doing their job and they have a directive and they're, they're going to achieve it. it. They're following a mission that's been given to them. Yes. And then there's nation state actors that are extremely patriotic and, and, and driven because they believe what they're doing is in the best interest of their country. So I'll I'll speak about things like the CCP, for example, very specifically. That okay. intelligence group in China is focused on doing right by their country. And there's a belief okay. system in that region that is very focused on the idea that if you can't protect the intellectual property that you have, then you don't deserve it. So they're very motivated and driven, which is interesting because it that doesn't... That is an interesting uh, quote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it changes the dynamic of how you deal with them because as a defender you're kind of like the early young young analysts and intelligence operatives i speak with kind of feel like it's a cartoon where the bad guys know they're bad guys and they're you know <laughs> we're gonna get the- yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> they're not like that they they really believe they're doing right in many cases and so they're as motivated and 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 uh, war heroes in their minds as as i think we are on the defender side okay. so it's extremely challenging when you look at it that way because they're not going to stop because you kind of embarrass No, they them. won't. They, they got a much yeah. larger cause that's not going to die. Right. And then there's the last sort of other side again, which is these take ransomware groups like Conti Group. My goodness, these yeah. guys have made billions of dollars. So if patriotism oh. isn't their motivator, billions of dollars mm-hmm. are, right? So the minds of these guys are just like any other human being that is now absolutely, you know, either driven with full steam ahead because of some patriotic mission or they're incredibly, incredibly wealthy now and are becoming sort of cyber oligarchs of their own. And they're, they're, they're commanding incredible amounts of power uh, that they're addicted to. So 
the battle is tough because it's not unlike what you see with the old school DEA and and the cartels. It's a very similar problem that we're facing on a on a, on a cyber front now. Yeah, the the thing was that there, when you look at these cyber criminals or you look at the cartels, in many instances, the the heads of them were confined to a geography or they're confined in their movement mm-hmm. because we knew who they were and if they crossed into a friendly nation, we would grab them. Right. Um, so even though these people are getting the money, I don't know how you spend all that cash when <laughs> I don't think you, you do. You, yeah. You, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when yeah. you really can't leave your uh, protective state, that's uh, so you wonder what what's really going on, and are they then using those monies to fund other nefarious things that we don't know about? Well, yes, exactly. I mean, you know, this the, the history repeats itself so clearly in in my mind you know um you look at old school mafias you know that resulted in things like las vegas manifesting if you look at the history of las oh, vegas yeah. fascinating it's a look, fascinating story bugsy very fascinating yeah. <laughs> yeah i was recently in mexico and you know and looking at all the incredible amazing touristic environments that have come about that have probably been funded by cartels right it's it's a known sure. known quantity so, you know, not all of these cyber criminals are wearing leopard skin on a yacht in the south of France carrying an ocelot. You see those guys with the That guy went to prison. The Lime Lamborghini guy, yeah. Yeah, the Lime yeah. Lamborghini guy. He went to prison. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now there there are those uh that get everyone else in trouble and are the pariahs within the community of the bad guys, but they're the ones that are very quiet, very controlled, very um methodical and functioning more like a professional than you'd you'd want to believe. So that's that's the other part of this is that the ones that make the headlines like that, they may be capable and skilled, but they're not very smart as far as maintaining their um, their operation. But there are ones that are indeed very capable and you're never going to hear about them. So what if we really go back to the fundamental of InfoSec and look at mm-hmm. the root causes where gaps get created in, in the DNA of the OEMs, those providers, is mm-hmm. there? Is there anything that should be done, can be done at that DNA level, I'll call it that, that can really alter the game and and make it incredibly difficult? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, So I always go back to this old modality of castle moat strategy and whack-a-mole, which is... Yeah, right. that's the prevalent majority. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is the problem, right? Because this this idea, and I have I have a, one of my podcast episodes is about. I won't I won't restate the whole podcast in this as an answer because people can go listen to this when they want. But I liken cybersecurity to one of three effectively kinds of defense mechanisms. One is a sea cucumber. Another is a turtle or armadillo. I'm in Texas, so I'll say armadillo. Um, and then another kind is either like a porcupine or sea urchin. We need to strive okay. to be more like a sea urchin or porcupine, not be a sea, and a sea cucumber, for those who don't know, its defense mechanism is to literally allow the predator to eat part of it, and hopefully the predator will leave enough of it alone so it can grow back. We're so uh. pathetically on that side rather than the other, that's the problem. And then that's sort of just the general modality of the way we address things, which is to be defensive not offensive in our protection, which is interesting. Okay. Um, the other problem is the lack of ability to understand when things manifest because you're essentially little Dutch boy with a lot of holes and too, too few fingers, yes. frankly. And right. the, the, the issue is inevitably believing, you know, like Kevin Mandia, who's huge, hugely, hugely inspirational to me and a very good friend, has been saying this for many, many years. It's not about if, it's when. And now right. the, the, the phrasing has changed to not when, but how long. It's not even about when. It's now, well, how long has it been there? And how long has it been dwelling within your environment? That's the problem. The longer something has the means to do reconnaissance within your environment, the more disadvantaged you're going to be. Most cybersecurity professionals know less about their network than cyber criminals do that have been lurking there for months. Those guys oh, have better I'm... mappings of networks than usually the actual security team do themselves. You so, know, the Secret Service yeah. asks, that is one of the two questions that they ask. 
-hmm. when they get involved with uh, a, a crime of this nature is do you have a detailed network diagram and know all the assets that are in place and where right. they sit? And the mm -hmm. overwhelming majority of the time, the answer to that is no. Sure. And it's it's not it, a fault of the people either. It's it's very hard, understandably. It is it, it is extremely hard. But then mm -hmm. given that, how do you reduce the dwell time? And I guess the second yeah. follow-up to that is why don't socks catch this on a telemetry base? Like they're deploying yeah. all these tools out there. Why isn't that data picking up on the mm -hmm. silent outlier? Well, yeah, and it's it's a it, the, it's very very broad, and and pretty much the remainder of this conversation could be this answer. Uh, to be fair, uh, <laughs> well, but we I, got twenty yeah. minutes, so <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep it we'll keep it concise. But I will say the number one challenge is that the adversary that they're looking for doesn't look like an adversary. It's usually something that social engineered its way into the environment and looks like a credible user. It it's. This is one thing I get a lot of pushback on because no one wants to believe what I'm saying is I'm a big, big proponent of saying it's not about vulnerability. It's about compromise. I say this a ton because there's a, there's a huge, huge divide between the folks that think if I just patch up all the vulnerabilities, I'm good. And I'm like, no, because the adversaries that you're worried about are not going to be leveraging those vulnerabilities. They're going to be getting in and acting as if they have purpose to be there. They're going to privilege escalate themselves into the environment and no security tool in the world. I don't care what it is or who's running it or who's built it will trump a valuable business operation because you'll get thrown out the door. CISOs get fired right. for that all the time. So that's exactly what these adversaries are leveraging. They're making their operations look like they're legitimately supposed to be happening in these companies, which is what increases the dwell time. So how the hell do you cut that down then where do where does one yeah. go to get the intelligence and i'm teeing you up for this mm -hmm. one <laughs> yeah <laughs> to, no, to, a great um yeah. you know yeah. that how do i know i'm a target or how do i know that someone yeah this is a possibility because one of the things we get from a lot of business and now understand we're down market so we're small medium business mm -hmm. and, and i don't mean down market in a negative way we're sure. just not in the enterprise and those people are like, well, we're just so small. Who cares? Nobody mm -hmm. cares about us. What are they going to get out of us? I make paper plates for Dixie. Right. Who cares? Yeah, you, you know? make paper plates for Coca-Cola, which is exactly the target they're going to use you to get into. That's, that's what I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and the way you reduce it, in a way, there's, there's many ways. But one of the ways I obviously am a huge, huge fan of is being able to watch the egress traffic from your network, not constantly staring at the front door where you think someone's going to be coming in and barring the door and you know, having a laser grid in front of it. What is slowly and quietly leaving out of your network? If people paid more attention to their DNS queries and had DNS logs and looked at all the bizarre locations that the machines in their company were going to, and even just broadly cross-referenced the egress traffic to a known bad list of C2s, or domains, you wouldn't believe what they'd catch. No one thinks about egress. Everyone thinks about ingress. Still, twenty-seven yes. years later in my career, absolutely. I yeah. and I agree with that. But now, let me. The difficulty, the, the mm -hmm. I guess, a question on that regard is: you look at the timing of these communications. A lot of times, when you're looking for the egress, these guys are going to make that communication so spaced out. The mm -hmm. frequency will not be consistent. If you're in the sock looking for that signal, you almost have to have a hunch that that looks bad. You're right. You know that, right? Yeah. How do you? You have to. You have to. You have to have an aperture to your point that is broad enough and wide enough to see that pattern manifest that no security tool on the inside is necessarily able to see, which is exactly what inspired me to build the company that I have now, which is that. If I can look at six months of egress traffic, because what I'm doing is collecting the traffic from where the adversary sits, which is the oh. the convergence point. I'm not trying to catch all the victims by running to all the victims to see what's wrong with them. I'm waiting to see what the bottleneck is for that traffic, which is where the adversary sits. And that lets me see. A, who's infected, and then what the cadence and frequency and velocity is of that beaconing from their environment. So if it's one week, 
I see the beacon happen every week. If it's every two hours, I see every two hours. If it's every three months, I still see it every three months. So that gives you an interesting perspective and has been a very hard thing for getting a lot of people to understand what I'm doing and how I'm doing it because it seems sci-fi like. But it, it does. I would be way... curious how you're getting the telemetry on that. So yeah. Prevalian is your, I guess, to mm-hmm. oversimplify it, you've infiltrated their infrastructure and you're listening. 100% in. correct. Yes, that's exactly right. So I'm sitting there as a small little spy within their environment to see who they've infected, which allows me to transfer that information back to the victim or tell the paper plate company that they are infected and will inevitably be a hop point into, we use a big soda maker as an example. Big big soda maker, yeah. It's a yeah. great example because there's a lot of, yeah. these megacorps have many small vendors and the supply chain to me, that third party risk is a great gap or vulnerability to go and exploit. You know, that, that's right. they're your conduit in. That's exactly it. It's it's the easy access in because if you're you're going against all the, all the security infrastructure that's been built up by an enterprise. But when you have one trusted channel of communication in, even if it's email from your third party partner, that's a supply chain attack. An email that yes. comes from a small company to a big one is literally a supply chain, a supply chain attack. It counts as that. Uh, exactly. So, and I take it the bad guys have the same issues in detecting you that we mm-hmm. have in detecting them. So they it's have not to... obvious to them. That's right. They have the same, we, we impose a, a cost incursion onto their profit center by doing what we do, which is the way to get them to stop actually financially impacting them. Do you get threatened by yes. these folks? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, this can't, be, they can't be taking this very lightly. I, I No, <laughs> no, they don't like what I'm doing at all. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, um, no easy answer on this one. Um, I have to be careful. Um, there's also a certain amount of, um, I have to decide when not to do certain things. There's other challenges I have in my business as well, by the way, which is that sometimes operations that are meant to be happening, otherwise known as intelligence community operations, I can't okay. tell the difference between that and an adversary environment sometimes. And so I have to make a really tough call on letting something be when I have a hunch that it might be an intelligence community effort versus a bad guy's effort. So we all kind of step on each other's toes sometimes. So bad guys, private sector companies like mine that are intelligence operations that are private, and then actual government intelligence operations that are legitimate, but look really, really bad. So and then we look bad to them. So we get chased around by the the good guys sometimes going that prevailing stuff. We don't they don't know it's us, they think it's a bad guy. So we're constantly there's no good communication, just like what the government has to deal with. There's not any better communication between private and public sector either. Um, so yes, it complicates and compounds the problem even further with the threat factor, which is last thing I want to do is irritate an intelligence community um, partner uh, alongside irritating <laughs> yeah. a, a, a foreign national government adversary. Oh, I... Yeah. <laughs> I think what the GRU had 5,000 PhDs, something in mm-hmm. that neighborhood that wake up every morning trying to figure out how they can destroy a computer system. So yeah. that's an adversary you don't really let sleeping no. dogs lie kind of a thing. Yeah. With that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, without, I, I know this is a sen- this is going to be a sensitive question. So if you can't answer it, that's sure. great. But is there any, um, any clue you can provide? How are you getting the telemetry? I mean, how's Prevalian mm-hmm. doing this? Like, yeah. And you're not wearing orange, so <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> true. So <laughs> yeah. So it goes back quite a ways. I mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation I was part of a pro- part of an effort, public private sector effort, back in the 0809 timeframe. And in that time frame, I was able to establish uh, relationships and a methodology that allowed me to um, infiltrate and s- quietly and silently reside within some of these environments. And that is a capability that I kept fostering and growing and nurturing. And now I have this incredibly vast connectivity network that allows me to get that Intel. So it is proprietary. So to be clear, I'm not just going scanning through IOCs or open source Intel and figuring this out. 
I'm not looking at net flow, which is what most people are thinking I'm doing by now. They're listening to this. Yeah. that know kind of how this works. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not looking at passive DNS and making some sort of inference that it's malicious. I'm actually seeing the beacon come from the malware in an environment to its command and control environment because I am becoming part of that fabric of the adversary. And that is a, that is a very interesting way to do it. You know, you remind me a lot of the Cold War days when mm -hmm. we actually had real humans in the field that became the fabric of another nation's infrastructure. And that's how we gathered real intelligence. Exactly right. right. It wasn't just from spy satellites or mm -hmm. <clears throat> drones, but it was actually people building relationships. Yes. That's exactly <laughs> it. To use the terminology, I'm probably as close to real humans in the SIGINT world as you get. So yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, but that's well said. That's I, I use Cold War analogies a ton, by the way, in my in my conversations with folks so they can understand what I'm talking about. You know, speaking of which, when you look at the Cold War, there was always this whole concept of mutually assured destruction. When we look at the mm. capabilities of cyber malfeasance, bad actors, and what they can do, is it real? that the capability exists to completely shut down a nation's infrastructure? Um, yes, the answer is yes. Now, it's not as simple as I think people have made it sound that it is. I mean, the, the threat is there. In fact, oh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I, wanna, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. This is actually a good part of the conversation I had with Rob, Rob Lee from Dragos, because he's incredibly... Um, tuned in to this particular issue, right? Because his firm is explicitly focused on ICS and, you know, industrial control systems and operational technology. And we got in this conversation because he actually said something very positive, which I liked. It was a nice change. It was a departure from the normal doom and gloom, which is we're all screwed. This is all over. Yeah. You know, the, the power grids are one ping away from going down. Or um, one you solar know. flare, which we can't do much about. There you go. Exactly. This is when the sun topic. starts to hack you, it's over, you know? Yeah. It's over. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but his point was that, look, you know, we do a, we do a fairly good job of defending in that regard, but, but, you know, he, he did concede and he agreed with me that unfortunately a motivated group that wants to come in and do some serious damage. I mean, look, he admittedly knows that he wouldn't be in business if this wasn't a legitimate problem, um, that there was a real, real viable scenario where, and I'm going to use the, good old buzzword here, but the asymmetry of the adversary is, is real. They really do have an advantage in that they can keep trying and failing while we can only fail once. And that's, that's kind of where that lies. And that could be across critical infrastructure, financial, health care, government. It's the same problem across all of those verticals. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's a scary thought that, you know, if the lights go out, well, mm -hmm. then as a nation, we got very serious issues at multiple levels yeah. where we no longer have that uh, backup infrastructure that's not reliant on the net communications to function it it's just it's gone at yes this point. yeah we paint ourselves right. into a bit of a corner now you're, you're right we, we have and i wish you know if we turn back the clock to the great depression those guys were tough if you killed the power on them, they'd be like, screw you. I don't care. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, light up a candle I, and get cooking. <laughs> get cooking, right? I, I don't think that's going to happen uh, no. in this. You know, a, another topic in the short time that we have that I know you're just going to be able to scratch the surface on, but the polymorphism of malware. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to explain that to our listeners because it's a fascinating topic. Sure. You know, as to what's happened and, and it's mm -hmm. real. It's, it's so. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll date myself with this answer. Um, everyone remembers the movie Terminator and then probably even more acute, more, more succinctly Terminator two, uh, when the famous one where that mercury looking guy showed up, that was, Oh yeah. Policeman and kept changing his appearance to, to avoid yep. detection and move through you know, the society un, unfound and, and whatnot. It could basically completely uh, make his way seamlessly from one place to another. That's essentially polymorphism. That's what that is. That's literally the ability for 
something to change its signature. Because as we all know, I think who's listening that are in cybersecurity, you're still we're still fundamentally on a very, very basic concept around identification based on signature or, or anomaly. Sure. Baseline being breached or broken, that gives you some tendency to say there's an outlier to your point earlier versus this is a signature of something that's malicious, literally a hash of a binary that you can go track. Polymorphism really is just this methodology that threat actors have employed very successfully, which is to change the DNA of their tool, otherwise known as malware or whatever they're using on what the fly. Are, what? Now, the, what's interesting about this is that it goes back to my methodology, which is that if, if a spy or malware, to use a Cold War analogy, cannot communicate and get directives from headquarters or its controller or its command and control to change its DNA, or if it doesn't have any kind of predestined timing for it, it'll get caught. So if you can stifle and muzzle a spy, I don't care if they're in the Oval Office, if they can't communicate right. out from there, they're essentially nullified and now inert because now you can catch right. them before they have the means to communicate and they won't change their appearance because they won't be given the directive to do so. So that ability to communicate outbound again and get directives and new versions of itself, that's a big part of this polymorphism, which is it'll download another binary updated version, which will now have a different hash that the AV or the EDR, or the XDR, whatever, doesn't have in its right. systems to identify it. So it gets away with murder. That's what that is. Yeah. And we see this all the time. You know, it, you might find a malware variant, but that mm -hmm. spawned off a bunch of ancillary processes mm -hmm. that you won't see unless you're really threat hunting and you're looking for that kind of stuff. And yeah, you have to happened. know what you're looking for and you don't know what you don't right. know. So what you need is something that will trigger a, a tip and cue you to something that you didn't realize was malicious that maybe is there the whole time that you assumed was um, benign, but gives you new information, new intelligence that changes the game for you. And that's the key. Now, let, this last question, because I know we're, we're running out of time, but this sure. is why we haven't even gotten halfway through no. but that's good <laughs> <laughs> so ai do you mm -hmm. see the evolution of malware merging with ai where it can become a like a real cancer cancer doesn't phone home it evolves mm -hmm. it destroys the body from the inside out can that be done are you yes um so it doesn't AI... phone home anymore no, it, it'll eventually have enough decision support internally to, well, to be clear, it, it'll inevitably always have to exfil Intel to be useful, unless it's built for sabotage. So I want to be clear. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like if its entire yeah. purpose is to destroy and it, it's sure. never, once it's released, it's on its own. Its purpose is massive disruption at whatever mm -hmm. it can do. Yes. If, if we could take Stuxnet and fast forward five, 10 years from now, it would be entirely self-reliant and would have probably continued on its rampage to do more damage wherever it was intended to go. And along with everything else that's out there. So yes, I completely, completely believe that they're going to start to build things that are entirely automated and don't need, uh, as, I'm, as I put it today, directives and orders from headquarters to, to achieve its, its goal. The key will be, will it be smart enough and will it use machine learning and, and neural networking capabilities and AI essentially to figure new ways out that maybe it would never have found today without it, without some sort of advice from, from its C2? Probably. So there's a chance that the and AI will scary. also add to the context of worm ability of something as well. Um, let me go find new methods and conduits that I didn't even, I wasn't even programmed for, for propagating myself. That could be something that could happen as well with poly, with uh, excuse me with AI, so it's AI by definition is meant to come up with new parameters that were not That's formally right. there, and that by definition that statement alone is absolutely horrifying when you start thinking about threats. Yeah, I've, that uh, that's a very scary thought. So mm -hmm. and it's not science fiction. So I, no. you know I've uh, ha and having someone like you actually give it seriousness, um, hopefully people are listening and, and they're, they start thinking about it.
Yeah. So Kareem, uh, we're in the last couple of minutes here. I want to give you the floor. Is there anything you want to plug? Any things you're up to? Any events, books, <laughs> any appearances you want to talk about? What, whatever you like. Charities, yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, very, very kind. Honestly, uh, I'm, I've got my heads down doing exactly what we talked about through this this podcast, which has been wonderful. Thank you for it. I would definitely recommend for those who are interested in my background and, and a little bit of my story, you know, whether it's purely cybersecurity interests or just general entrepreneurialism, go find my podcast. It is actually really fun to listen to. I don't have a real agenda there. I'm not advertising on it or anything yet. Maybe if it gets big enough, I, I'll do that. But uh, it is the introverted iconoclast. I have it at the introverted iconoclast.com, but you can also okay. find it on Apple and Spotify and just about everywhere. So it's, it's there. Um, as far as, um, other events and things like that, that I'm going to be doing nothing, nothing immediate, uh, okay. but, uh, stay tuned because I do have some announcements probably coming up in the next month or so. Well, if you have any big ones, please, you're always welcome to come back and, uh, thank you. We'd be glad to have you. And we'll put the links in the show notes uh, back to your podcast. Wonderful. So. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much, Kareem. This has been a fascinating conversation. Really Take care. Time. You too.